you're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Land. This podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Tiffany Cruikshank and Katya Bach, as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs. Hello, Dana, and welcome to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. Thank you very much for making time for us today. Thanks so much for having me, Rachel. I'm excited. Me too. Any excuse to have a chat with you, I feel like I will take, even if it's talking about parenting, which is definitely <laughs> not high up in my um, areas of expertise. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say I'm an expert at it either, but yeah, it'll be fun to chat about the, the journey. Well, maybe that's where we start by stressing for listeners that you are here, not as a parenting expert, but just as a person, a human and a yoga teacher, sharing from your own experiences, what you found interesting and informative and helpful. Yeah, exactly. And I think for me too, the, the overlap between the, the yoga journey and the parenting journey is is mainly the what's interesting to me. And I think, I hope that's where our conversation will inspire other people as well. Mm, I think so. I mean, I obviously don't know anything much about conscious parenting at all, but from what I understand, the the sort of core concepts revolve around self-awareness and mindfulness. And I think these are concepts that are going to be really interesting to people who listen to this podcast anyway. But I thought we might start by talking about where you were introduced to those practices. Was it through yoga or something else? I would say I started as um, not really through yoga, actually, just more as a child. I started journaling at a really young age, probably as soon as I learned to write. I can remember being six or seven and having a diary with, you know, like a little lock. And <laughs> that was very exciting. The little, lock. When you're a kid, being able to lock things up is so potent, isn't it? Absolutely. Especially when it's your most private thoughts. <laughs> um, so I would say that's really where the reflection, self-reflection started and, it just helped me um, be able to process the world around me. Mm. And yeah, I probably journaled for many, many, many years. And eventually, I did start yoga know, quite young as I was first exposed to it when I was 12 through dance. And I suppose the mindfulness aspects began then. But I, I wouldn't say that I... And it was sort of the journaling and the self-reflection in those teenage years. And I remember my dad bought me a um, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens <laughs> book when I was a teenager, probably 15 or 16. I remember learning the words paradigm shift in, in that book and kind of that you actually had the option to change your mind or change your perspective, that that was a possibility you weren't locked into one way of thinking or one way of doing things uh, so that was yeah more teenage years and then a more formal mindfulness I suppose in terms of meditation came a lot later like I, I first with yoga was more about the poses and the physical aspect and then meditation started more in my mid-30s mm. it's Something about being around kids, I feel like, gives you, you know, we've talked about yoga and journaling as internal reflections. Something about being around kids gives you this external reflection of things that you might say or express or do. I remember being with a family member of mine when she was about four, and I think I offered her some food. She said, oh, I can't have that. I'll get fat. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I, you know, she's heard that from probably so many places already at age four and doesn't even really internalize what it means. It's more of a reflection of what's been said to or around her. So I imagine as soon as you have kids, 
any of your existing practices of mindfulness and self-awareness probably change a little bit from you seeing things reflected back to you. And I, I read a post of yours on Instagram that I thought was just a great example of that, where I think you'd posted a selfie, a very rare um, selfie that's, you know, not, not on the beach or, you know, somewhere where you're <laughs> joyful and happy, you looked kind of tired. <laughs> and you said, currently working so hard at not yelling at my child and using positive language instead. Ugh, it's so challenging. I find myself saying, no, don't stop or else and giving explanations that make no sense to a two-year-old. It's no wonder we speak to ourselves so harshly and don't believe in ourselves. We internalize this language from such a young age and I hear it when he reflects back at me, you can't mummy. I'm trying to learn how not to just dominate over him and instead connect through imagination, song, patience, touch, and love. Also, I'm learning to make my requests smaller of him and also of myself. And I thought that this was a really beautiful statement to kick us off into conscious parenting because that's that's exactly it, isn't it? Is noticing mm -hmm. your patterns and going, ugh, there they are in my face. <laughs> So, yeah, that's exactly it. You know, the children are their little mirrors. And in those early years, especially, which I feel I'm still in as I have a one-year-old and four-year-old, life is happening so fast. I'm sure actually everyone can relate to that. Life seems to have especially sped up in the last few years. Um, but you're so tired a lot of the time. And you do things just kind of come out of your mouth. And a lot of it is, you know, the way that, at least I feel, the way that I was raised, I suddenly see that just kind of coming through me. And almost some days where sometimes I'm like, did I just say that? Like, mm. who am I? What's going on? And feeling, and at that time in particular, feeling just ineffective as a parent, you know, raising this child and seeing his, the way he's interacting with the world and going, hang on a second, is this, is this what I'm intending? You know, is this how I want to see the, him out there interacting with other people? So, yeah, it was around that time um, that I, I started looking for resources, just recognizing that, okay, I've never done this before. And parenting doesn't come with a manual. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I I think a lot of times our, yeah, as I said, our parenting styles tend to either be what we've been conditioned to or in opposite. A lot of people go, well, I'm definitely not doing that, you mm -hmm. know. But so even that comes do. from that unconscious scripting, doesn't it? I'm going to do exactly the opposite one one way or another especially when we're acting on impulse, when, you know, we're in a rush or we're tired or it, it's not a situation that we can sit down and plan. It's got to come from uncon unconscious patterning somehow, hasn't either in the direction of or in the direction away from. Yeah. And I think that's true in, you know, all of our relationships mm. as well, that we can apply a lot of these um, aspects to, you know, romantic relationships or friendships or work relationships. We do in general, I and mean, I think that's a big reason why people are drawn to yoga is to get out of that unconscious autopilot mm -hmm. behavior and live with more intentionality and more purpose and more meaning. Mm -hmm. And as you said, with children, I think there's such a, for me at least, there's such, there's such a drive to go okay, I need to do something about this because it's not just about me anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah, I think I went through, definitely with my partner, there was a phase of kind of going like, okay, well, I can't change you and I have to you know, embrace and accept. <laughs> <laughs> and remember children, that this is what I fell in love with to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But with children, I'm like, actually, this is my responsibility. At least I feel it is my responsibility to to help you and to, to provide guidance, um, in a way that, you know, it, it's just not just about me. And yeah. I, and that's where it became very 
motivating for me to go, okay, how do I, how do I do this? You know, how do I, how do I connect with my child, Mm -hmm. um, with my two-year-old who's got these big emotions and is, you know, at two, they really start to, um, understand that they're not a part of me you know this mm-hmm. so they I start to self-identify and individuate and they're kind of it's huge for them it's massive and so you do have a very strong real child as a lot of parents probably would say about their children um and you're like oh I can't really force you and I can't control you and that's not pleasant either. So mm-hmm. how do we how do we get on the same page? And I think also a, a big part of conscious parenting is being able to see see the child as an individual and as mm-hmm. their own person. So yes, we have a lot of similarities, and you know he also has a lot of similarities to his father, but he's also his own person. And mm-hmm. you know how do I honor that? How do I interact with him in a way that um, is not me imposing my will or my agenda, you know, on, onto them, both of them. So yeah, that was I think a big part of it for me too. And this is probably a really good time to to define for people what is conscious parenting, or at least how would you define it, given that you know you're not a psychologist. But what does it mean to you? Well, to me, it's really about going inwards mm-hmm. and you know being able to examine what beliefs and values I'm bringing to parenting and being able to look at those and decide whether they're valid and they're effective and and helpful or not or you know do I need to go through a paradigm shift in order to really show up to be the best parent that I can be you know to be the kind of parent that um to make the best decisions that are going to impact my family as well. So it's very much about going inward and being able to notice that internal state, you know, am I really agitated right now? Is my child getting on my nerves? And therefore, am I about to say something I don't actually mean or I don't want to say, you know, do I need a moment? Do I need to calm my body? Um, Do I need to help him, you know, calm his body or her body? And then, you know, have the chat later. So it's just being able to go through that reflection and whether it's in the moment or later on, either one I think is is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, So then, yeah, to be able to show up and be a really good mom. That's what it is for me. There's a whole other side to conscious parenting as well. And there's a book by Dr. Shafali Sabari around this that goes a lot deeper and I think um there's like a more of a spiritual aspect to it as well so if that interests people you know they might be able to dive into that book but I think yeah whether you're sort of in the style of conscious parenting or you're just applying the principles of consciousness Mm -hmm. you know to your parenting it's just about that yeah going inwards and, and being driven by that that internal state as opposed to the external, you know, the pressures of society or what are my friends doing? How are my friends parenting? You know, what are my peers up to? Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, I I love the concept of it because for me, it sounds like it really does apply to all relationships. You know, what what baggage am I bringing in in terms of expectations that that somehow your behavior or actions would reflect something about me. Can I unpack those and kind of set them to one side and actually deal with what happened here or, or what I'd like to happen here? I think it's heightened when it comes to parents and kids because it's just a different quality of relationship, isn't it? With, with two adults, there's even footing and you might be able to say something and then circle back and say, you know, I, here's the context of that. Of course, I didn't mean it, but with somebody who's as sensitive as a child, it might be too late to undo the the pain that that's caused. So I see parenting as this sort of pinnacle example of behaviors that we probably bring to all of our relationships. And as soon as you talk about societal pressures, I know I've seen a lot of uh, seen or heard comments from parents saying, you know, the kid having the tantrum in the, in the food shop or the grocery store and what that says about them was probably nothing, but there's this constant awareness that you're not just in a private relationship with this person 
there's some communal ownership almost or interest in that relationship, which we don't have anywhere near to the same degree in work relationships or romantic relationships. Yeah, I think there's that, um, you know, could you imagine like having, I mean, some people do, but that very external outward display of conflict at a workplace or, um, you know, a private, in a romantic relationship being out in public. And I think it's it's like what you said, like the children have, they don't have that filter. So they're mm. going to express their emotion and their disappointment and their, you know, them disagreeing with the decisions that are being made, they're just going to express it in the moment. <laughs> I tell you, I'm in the midst of watching the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City at the moment, and there have been a lot of unfiltered reactions in season two that, yeah, alcohol, I think, can get adults to the place where toddlers probably start <laughs> feeling yeah, all their yeah. emotions. Or, or scripted reality TV shows that, that is What well. scripted? What? No, it's <laughs> real, Donna. It's all real. So talking about conscious parenting and, and not about real housewives, could you give us maybe an example of a situation? Maybe it's one that you've actually had, or maybe it's just one that you can pull out of thin air that could go one way or it could go another way, depending on your own internal awareness of what you're bringing to the interaction versus just reacting in the heat of the moment. Yeah. Uh, well, even just this morning, I was making my coffee and my son, Zaya, he, um, you know, kids are not so in control of their bodies all the time, which we, which we know. And when they get really excited, they move their bodies in a way that is, uh, potentially in conflict with <laughs> what I was trying to do. So I was heating up some milk for my my coffee. And, you know, as a tired mom, this is like a really important moment of my day. I'm like, coffee. I've never and, identified more with you than I am in this moment right now, imagining something coming between me and my morning coffee. <laughs> anyway, I poured the milk into my cup and at the moment he is really into having his morning drink which is a um it's a healthy hot chocolate drink it's this chocolate powder that secretly has greens in it and probiotics and he has no clue and it's great you will listen uh, to this as a teenager and be like damn you mother (laughs) hopefully he'll be like thanks mom yeah probably (laughs) Maybe by his 20s, he'll be thanking you. I'm tall and strong. Anyway, (laughs) um, he is very into doing it himself. And there's uh, on the little, it's a little milk frother machine and you have to press the button four times. And I was about to press the button and he was like, no, I want to do it. And in that moment, he was actually holding like a bamboo bowl and he threw the bowl to get to the button before me. And it knocked my mug over and my milk spilled. And that meant I have to wait. You know, we were making his drinks, so I meant I had to wait. And of course, I got really agitated and got really upset and did not react well in that moment. You know, and I said to him, I was like, How many times have I told you to stop throwing things? And instantly I was like, Oh, I felt terrible, you know? So, I think that it's not necessarily about, it would have been great if I could have slowed myself down enough to recognize that I was about to yell at him. But of course, because I hadn't had my coffee yet, my brain this wasn't This is a descriptive show. This is an actual morning in a real household with, with honest human people. <laughs> yeah. So, it, you know, but I did instantly be able to tune into that internal feeling of going, Ooh, that felt really bad that I yelled at him when he was just really excited and he couldn't control that excitement in his body. He's only four. He can't do that yet. Uh, and so just, again, having that, that moment to go, oops, you know, like that wasn't how I wanted to react. And I could instantly feel that he felt really bad, you know, about something that he didn't mean to do. It was an accident on his part, really. Um, so what I, what I wanted to add and going back to something that you said a few minutes ago is, you know, in terms of being able to, with adults, we might come back and say, you know, this is the context. Another big part of conscious parenting is actually a lot of sort of the experts call it repair, 
Hmm. which is being able to say to your child, hey, I'm sorry, I, I messed up. I didn't actually mean to act in that way. And I'm sorry that I yelled at you, uh, you know, or I'm sorry that X, Y, Z, whatever it is, and being able to have that conversation with them in, in terms that they can understand. And I love that. Yeah. So that, you know, they can, they actually do understand quite a lot. Hmm. They, and it's that I think the emotion behind it that they can pick up on, mm. that they really can feel the sense that like, oh yeah, you know, my parents mess up too, and and yeah. they own up to it. Yeah, I guess he's able to relate because he had a really similar experience. I didn't, I didn't mean to. It didn't go the way I wanted it to do. Uh, and he's seeing you model things don't always go the way you want them to but you can always apologize and explain and repair the relationship that's great I love that can't do that with dogs tragically (laughs) yeah do it (laughs) and then it's like you know they don't have to hold on to that pain I think that repair helps them to to process that and let go of that and you know, he's, I actually think Zaya is really great at saying that he's sorry or, you know, come back around a little bit later. And um, when he's, he, uh, we were away at a friend's house and he, um, he had been given a gift of these uh, bath mark, bath paints that you can, um, you know, different colors that you can draw pictures in when you're in the bath and all that. And he took one out of the bath with him. And I had been telling him, like, put that back, put that back. He wasn't listening. And then he accidentally um, drew on. He didn't mean to. He was just holding it and, again, moving his body in a way that he couldn't control. And he actually got some of this, like, dark blue color on this beautiful white uh, duvet or comforter. And he was just like, and he really really loved my friend auntie claudie and so he was really nervous you know about her finding out and i was amazed the next morning he actually said to her auntie claudie did something that you're not gonna like and he fessed up to it straight away you know and i i thought okay because you have these moments where you're like is any of this sinking in you know yeah I'm trying so hard. Parenting is so hard. Yeah. Is any of this conscious parenting stuff even working? Like, <laughs> and well, then, I love that in the example that you gave initially, it wasn't that you handled the situation perfectly with grace and patience. It was much more how I can imagine it going in my household. But the fact that you can circle back afterwards and go that, I'm sorry I shouted. I didn't mean to shout. I know it wasn't intentional. I love the fact that it's it's never too late that recognizing mm-hmm. instantly in yourself that's not how I wanted it to go is is conscious enough. You don't have to have precognition. You can yes. have postcognition. That's I feel like a lot a lot more reassuring to me than always being aware of how I'm reacting in situations that can be I imagine pretty quick. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people a lot of people say, "No, you must be such a zen mom." I'm like, well, no, Sometimes, actually, maybe. <laughs> not. I do the yoga because I need the Zen, you know? <laughs> I that's when I can recognize that actually I'm very reactive inside and my mind goes a million miles miles per hour too. Mm-hmm. And I need these tools just as much as anybody else. And just because I teach them doesn't mean I'm, you know, perfect at them all the time. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, I think parenting, this, this conscious parenting really allows us to bring the yoga into the relationship, which, you know, isn't that what yoga is about in a way? You know, Ideally. Yeah. Ideally. Yeah. You mentioned earlier too about recognizing agitation in your body or recognizing agitation in, in his body or, you know, or her body when, when Junie's older. And I'm sure that's a skill that you've honed through practicing yoga and through teaching yoga as, as well, kind of noticing what agitation feels like and what it looks like. So what kind of tools can you use with kids to to calm that? You know, in, in yourself, you know, you can take a couple of more deliberate breaths mm-hmm. and, you know, unclench your hands or release your jaw or, you know, whatever your kind of target spots are. How does it work with kids? 
the breath actually is the best tool um, mm. because they, yeah, it, I mean, they are able to feel that in their body and it's more exaggerated. So it's, it's quite fun and you can use visuals with them. So, um, you know, you can start really just by asking them to blow on your face when they're really upset and crying and just them trying to do it. <laughs> I'm imagining snot took me to a bad place. I guess as a parent, you get a little desensitized to maybe having some snot on your face. Absolutely. I deal with it first. So <laughs> that one, or you can take get a tissue, you know, and, you know, one of my friends likes to say, you know, try to blow a hole through the tissue. And so it just gets them to do that more um, exaggerated breath to just start to feel like get in touch with what it is to have a deeper breath but they learn very quickly how to you know take a big breath or take a deep breath and then mm. you know you can also say like imagine like you're blowing out through a straw so that helps them to slow slow that breath down mm. uh, and it's yeah it doesn't have to be complicated and it's great because it works so quick you don't need to get anything else you don't need you know your phone for some music or any other external tool scented candles dim lighting it's so true though isn't it I think we've yeah. all had situations in our own bodies or with adult students that within a minute a change in breathing proceeds to change in complete mental and physiological state yeah and I again I know it works with him because the other day I was crying and he came to me and he said take a deep breath and I did it and then he goes and another one in this <laughs> oh, total voice as well and again mama that's really sweet so it, it works yeah. Any other sort of things that you found that have been incredibly helpful either for yourself or, or for him yeah counting to 10 is mm. incredibly incredibly helpful for for both people but obviously they need to learn to count to 10 first mm. uh, but that one is is really great for me too it's you know you start to feel like ah, you know how am I about to react and or just even sensing like okay this is really bothering me something that my child is doing right now I'm not okay with it I don't even know what to say next because often I'm in that situation I'm like you know am I about to say a threat like do this or else you know am I about to take away a privilege that has nothing to do with what you've just yeah. done or you know have you said some words that you don't really know what they mean and I guess counting to 10 just gives you that space that calms your body um and and they can do that too when they they learn to count or even when they don't know you can count out loud with them so they can mm. start to repeat after you um that one's really helpful I love that um, that's the gap between stimulus and response isn't it yeah exactly yeah. yeah and then the other one that we do um we have a yoga bug book uh actually that was gifted to me by one of our 200 hour teacher trainees uh, when I was um, pregnant with Zaya and the first pose of that is humming bee. So you're kind mm. of sitting cross-legged in Sukhasana and this, um, yeah, the hands are out like this. It's quite cute. And it says to, to hum like a, a bee. And so you go, hum, hum. And so it's, it's basically a, a version of Ramari breath. And it's great because it has a visual for, mm. for the child so they can, connect to that visual and it's another moment to just pause and kids love imagination anything imaginative there it's it's a way of connecting with them too so that one is is quite fun um if they're willing to do it mm -hmm. yeah I mean I'm kind of thinking here that there's so much about conscious parenting that applies to all of the relationships that we have in our lives partially being aware of our own responses, like, wow, that triggered me. And that in itself, just knowing that and feeling that is a huge first step instead of just instinctively lashing out to have the awareness to go, whoa, I can feel a visceral response to that. I obviously need to pause before I say or do anything about it. And the other part that I think is so important is recognizing that the other person is a separate individual sovereign being that may or may not change at all 
based on what you want. I think that's important in parenting. I think that's really important in romantic partnerships, as you said before, you know, that's one of the reasons my partner and I are still together after 30 plus years is because both of us acknowledge that you're not me. You will do things differently. It's part of why I love you. It's part of why you drive me crazy and it's probably not going to change. So that, that space between you and the relationship that, that I think you've spoken about that I also think applies probably to all relationships when we really break them down. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when we get disappointed in relationships, it's usually when we've kind of meddled into that space, you know, yeah, or made up some story. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've put expectations onto that person that are unrealistic or perhaps more about us than them. Mm. And yeah, that connection part of it is so important, regardless of whether it's a child or you know, a partner or a friendship, mm. you know, where is that middle ground? You know, how do we, how do we meet there? And if we can meet there, then we can respect each other and appreciate what's, you know, the, all the good things about one another. Um, I think, yeah, there's this expectation in parenting where you're like meant to automatically love your child which for some, you know, I think for some moms that happens straight away, for some, it doesn't. Mm. And you have to work at that, at that connection. I think it's the connection that really creates that foundation for a good relationship. You can't just rely on automatic love being there. Yeah. I think it's really important that that's said more often because I've heard this from a few parents of, you know, for some of them, the second the little hand closes around their finger, that's it, they're lost. And for other people, they're kind of looking at this small creature going, oh, you know, oh, no, I'm supposed to feel all of these feelings. And I don't feel anything at all, except really, really sore and really, really tired. Mm -hmm. And I think both of those experiences are equally realistic and equally valid. But at some point down in the future, you'll have a long term relationship with this strange little creature. So I guess like all relationships, being patient to see how it, how it evolves and how it changes as you get to know this person. Yeah. And getting on their, you know, getting on their level, I think is, is so important and not, it's not something that comes natural to a lot of parents, um, you know, being able to be in your kid's shoes. It's like mm. we expect them to behave like adults or, um, cooperate like adults and that's really tough for them mm. and going back to the the post of mine that you read at the beginning of this conversation mm. at that time I read this book it was called um, joyful toddlers and preschoolers by Faith Collins and we'll put all of this for people all the references in the show notes for people um, and she has an acronym in there called smile and that's essentially what I was referencing in that post so s is song m is movement i is imagination l is uh, love I think or laughter and e is exaggeration mm. so when you're trying to basically get your child to cooperate you can use one of those techniques and the more you use together you know is better so Say, for example, I'm trying to get my child to get out the door and we need to put on shoes and they're just not budging at all. You know, I may, I might say something like, let's hop like a bunny to get to the door and, you know, have a little tune that goes along with it and actually do the movement. And then there's imagination and might change the volume of my voice or something for that mm. exaggeration bit. Um, so it's not just about communicating clearly what you want or need, which might work in a work relationship or an adult relationship. It's about communicating in a way that the other person is going to be able to take in and will be interested in and more likely to respond to. Yeah. And I think for, for me, I really needed someone else to give me the tools to mm -hmm. go, okay, how do I connect with this child? How do I get on this child's level? How do I get them to cooperate without me having to yell at them and threaten them and, you know, <laughs> take away privileges. Like that stuff just doesn't work. It might work initially, at least mm. for us, 
it didn't work long term. It was like, oh, okay, after a while, they kind of go, okay, whatever. I don't need that toy anymore. I'll play with something else, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, that uh, yeah, I just needed those tools to, to figure out how do I get on this child's level? How do we create this relationship? You know, and, and being able to create that relationship from a really young age so that when they're a teenager, they feel that that connection is still there. When they have like really big problems, they'll want to come to me because we've connected from a really young age. And I think that's also a really big, for me at least, a really big part of conscious parenting is recognizing that again now is the time to really set these foundations it's never too late you can always you know begin again um that's the beauty of children is they're always living in in the present and and what is you know so that for anyone I think who's listening to this and may be going like oh I haven't done any of that Because I do feel that way too sometimes. I feel that way too when I listen, you know, to, I might listen to an audiobook or a podcast or something and kind of going, oh, I haven't done any of that. Mm. Children, they'll always respond to how you're showing up in the present. Mm. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And I think, again, there are a lot of takeaways for other relationships as well about communicating in the way that the other person is likely to listen to and it never being too late to to kind of approach a relationship in a new or a fresh way or with a renewed sense of awareness of what you're bringing to it and how they might be feeling about it or what they might want from it. And just the acknowledgement that all relationships, I think really when you boil down to it are are long-term, the ones that matter in our lives anyway, have a, a longevity to them. And so it's kind of the, it's the, the critical massive things that really determine the relationship, not any, one moment a lot of the time yeah and maybe we should also add in here to that relationship to self yeah you know you can't motivate yourself to do much you know or make any changes or um i think you that's you know part of what yoga is so great at is that building that connection to yourself and having that ability to to love yourself or do nice things for yourself and figure out how to, again, going back to that post, it's like, well, how do I change the way I talk to myself? Yeah, I was thinking about that. And it was kind of implied in the the post that I read that you were going to ask less of him and ask less of yourself. That kind of got me thinking about, for a lot of us, I think the way that we speak to ourselves, we say things that we would never say to another person unless we were, you know, in such an emotional state of being triggered and and lashing out reactively. And yet we would talk to ourselves like that. I think a lot of us (laughs) all all the time. (laughs) Yeah. Guilty. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I hadn't thought of that, but you're absolutely right. It's never too late to start a fresh relationship with ourselves and to be a little kinder and a little more conscious. And I think anyone listening to this is, somebody who has some experience with yoga and they're probably hearing a lot of tie-ins from what you've been saying and aspects of yoga philosophy and and the deeper practices of of yoga and I know that's a big passion area of yours yoga philosophy Mm. yeah I I, yeah again I'm not necessarily an expert in yoga philosophy but from a really young age I was very interested in you know self-help books and and different philosophies or concepts to um, spark awareness and connect on a, I suppose, more emotional and mental level. And and that's what brought me to yoga in the first place. Uh, So it was a pretty um, natural connection for me with the the philosophy of yoga and being able to bring that into the physical practice of yoga. It's like, how do we kind of what what else is you know what what are we shifting what are we looking at when when we go inwards um and so i think there's lots of beautiful concepts in you know the philosophy that we can apply to again all of our relationships Mm -hmm. Uh, and to tie into what you were you were just saying i think that ahimsa that we tend to think of it as like non-harming when it comes to the physical practice but 
on that emotional level is how do I give myself that compassion? Because as human beings, we mess up all the time or things don't go our way. And we might blame ourselves and be really hard on ourselves, but how do we flip that around? And what does that compassion look like? Maybe it does look like asking less of ourselves or embracing the messiness of whatever situation you're in. Bath paint in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the walls. and. <laughs> I think it, you mentioned earlier too about hopefully that's what happens from yoga practice is that the skills that we learn when we're sitting on the mat or when we're meditating or breathing mindfully or delving into philosophy, hopefully those things trickle off the mat outside of the textbook and into the way that we interact in our daily lives. And I know you have a monthly dose on yoga medicine online about getting the most from yoga philosophy in your practice, you know, ways that you can weave that into your practice. It sounds like that's something that you, that you do weave it into your life. It's become a bigger practice of mine in the last few years um, mm. since having kids, because before kids, I could spend as much time as I wanted on my mat and or on my you know meditation cushion. And then when, you know, now that I have kids, and to be really honest, some days I don't get on my mat at all. Uh, and I still really need the tools and the mm. techniques. So there are times where it is more of remembering, okay, I have felt this way before in my body when I'm, you know, I've been on my mat and yeah, let me take a deep breath or, you know, let me remember some of these concepts of, I think contentment, santosha is such a big one because so time for I get to the end of the day and sometimes I might not have crossed anything off my list you know and, and <laughs> but then you have to remember that you know just being there for the children that is a practice and that is huge that I mean, parents are everything for their children especially in that first year when you have this baby that you know barely interacts with you um it, that feeling of like, okay, I haven't done anything today can be very overwhelming. And so the practice of contentment can help to bring some peacefulness, hopefully. I love that you mentioned that too, because I think there's a connotation with contentment that it's contentment at this sort of level of bliss, like everything's everything's good and I'm happy with everything because it's good, but it's not really that at all, is it? It's it, Everything is what it is. And some yeah. days that probably is good. And some days that's probably fairly crappy, but can I just make peace with things exactly as they are without needing them to change, knowing that there's impermanence built in to a human existence? Yeah. And everything's a phase. I have mm -hmm. to remind myself of that constantly, probably daily, but I would say like, okay, this is a phase, you know, um, before I know it, we'll be in a different phase and I won't even remember this one probably, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's that em embracing the messiness mm. is a big part of the practice of santosha, of contentment, and that shows up in the practice of yoga too. I mean, so so many of us get on the mat and we start doing these poses and wish they were different, mm -hmm. or that we could do them differently. And it's kind of like, okay, well, this is the body I have today. Yeah. And I think there's been a lot of undercurrents of self-study in what you've talked about so far too, of, of, of noticing I came in with an expectation that I hadn't even verbalized that it would be this way and it isn't this way, whether it's that I didn't cross anything off my list or that the pose doesn't look or feel the way I thought it would. Step one is always to notice, oh, I was measuring up against a standard that I hadn't even been aware of and it came up short or I'm feeling great because I exceeded that requires you to notice oh I brought in that expectation I came thinking it would be a certain way or I'm feeling a certain way and that in itself is just a massive underpinning for living a more self-aware life whether it's in mm. our relationships with others or our practice or ourselves isn't it yeah that's the self-study is definitely underpins the conscious parenting or I think in the yoga practice as well, ultimately, we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to get to that place where we can perhaps quiet the noise enough in order to do that, right? I don't think it's 
you necessarily get on your mat and that happens automatically. It's like, it's a process of, mm -hmm. of getting there. Um, of, you know, starting to become aware of whether that's thoughts or sounds or uh, feeling sensation to then be able to take that further and go, okay, well, I've noticed, you know, these certain things and now maybe I can put that together and notice a pattern about myself. Mm. And then I think from there to other concepts um, that tie in, especially to the, to the relationship part of it is both the parigraha, that non-coveting and non-possessiveness and asteya, which is that non-stealing. So I think they really go together. So with the non-possessiveness is that recognizing like what we said, well, you're not me and mm -hmm. you're not, if I'm in a relationship with you, I'm not here. You're, I can't control you. You know, whether that's again, friend, partner, coworker, child. And it shows up so much, I think, in raising children of that sense. Oh, for sure. Like, because mine. there is this sort of societal assumption that your child is a reflection of your parenting. So, you know, if they're having a meltdown when you're trying to shop, that's obviously bad parenting. Or if they're not getting good grades, it's obviously bad parenting. Or if they're, you know, playing up or making friends with the wrong crowd, it's obviously bad parenting. But really, at the end of the day, you've got to make peace with the fact that you do what you can do, but there is still this unique individual who brought their own set of, you know, their own bundle of characteristics with them into the world and their experience will be unique and yeah. separate from yours. Yeah, and they have different do what you preferences. Do. They have, you know, they have the things that they like and that they don't like and what they're drawn to. And sometimes those are similar to, you know, to mine and sometimes not. They, mm. they, you know, like... Uh, my son Zaya is I would say he's quite extroverted he can he loves having conversations with anyone he meets <laughs> wouldn't say that's the same about you know about me or even my partner where I would put us in more of the introverted category you know nice to have um, one in the family so that you know when you travel you can send him out first to sort of yeah, meet exactly. the world for you <laughs> Yeah, he's also going to be our negotiator and <laughs> our <I'm> lawyer. <laughs> no, but I love that you mentioned that because I do think that there are societal societal expectations around, you know, what a good kid looks like and therefore what good parenting is and what yeah. a bad kid looks like and therefore what bad parenting is. And I imagine as a parent, it becomes a really crucial, although I'm sure not easy practice to to create separation between how they are showing up in the world and what that says about you or even what expectations you've internalized that you might not even be aware of that you could be projecting on them that actually have nothing to do with them and yeah. maybe even nothing to do with you when you actually sit down and look at them. Yeah, I, that, that line is so blurry and mm. difficult, I think, mm. to really um, carve out because again, I do feel I have a responsibility to shape who, who he is. You know, I don't think I can control who he is and I'm trying to do my best to, you know, give him a good example of what a decent human being is and, you know, how to be kind, be, be thoughtful, kind, all be the good things. Yeah, be respectful, mm -hmm. be patient. Um, but then also honoring his who he is you know how does he want to show up in the world and um you know if he wants to be loud and boisterous you know how do I make space for that mm -hmm. and and kind of go okay well let me help you know let me help you in the places that you need help you know and and yeah that's just such a tricky line there between that brings my to life. my mind the diligent practice and non-attachment the two wings of of Patanjali that come up for me in pretty much anything I look into really deeply of doing the things showing up with enthusiasm you know even when you don't get your coffee first thing when you need it but continually trying to do the right thing trying to do the conscious and kind and self-aware thing uh, knowing that occasionally you'll screw up and also the universe has its own plans. And so creating some distance between the fruits of those labors and, and the labors themselves. I mean, yeah, absolutely. that's kind of everything, isn't it? Parenting, work, life, relationships. 
And then that comes back to the Asteya too, the the non-stealing is, you know, also recognizing like that my kids are not here to please me. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, I know for me as a child, I very much wanted to please my parents. Um, I was the younger child and that just was a place where I could slot myself in and be, feel really safe. And that stayed with me for a really, really long time. It shows up, you know, I've let a lot of it go, but it still shows up. And I'm becoming aware of that and in my interactions with my children of, um, you know, what I'm asking them to do and and how I'm asking them to interact in the world too. And, and trying to motivate them from a place of like, don't do this for me, you know, do this, do this for you, you know, and that's, that's really hard trying to um, yeah share with them those tools and techniques in all honesty it sounds like the hardest job in the world it's also very rewarding that's what yeah. people say it's true <laughs> <laughs> there are so, a lot of really beautiful moments and I think I've, we've mentioned a few of them already mm. um, in my own personal experience and <laughs> Yeah, I definitely signed up for it, and uh, I think I've always been interested in growth and and self reflection and being able to learn from the experiences that that I live in. And one thing I wanted to add a little while ago too, and I'm glad it's come back up now, is children teach us how to have fun. You know, they teach us how to be in the moment and connect to joy and you know laughter and and embrace uh, the mess embrace them they, yeah they don't care at all about mess they <laughs> they're all for it they're here for the mess <laughs> they don't have to clean it up so, we so this might be a nice place nice place to kind of wrap up and talk about you know, takeaways, what would you like people to take away from this conversation? Maybe in relation to parenting, maybe just in relation to any relationships that matter to them, what would you like people to retain or think about? Yeah, I think firstly and foremost, it's never too late. You know, if you're, if, if you're feeling perhaps um, not content with how the relationship is going, it's never too late to to reflect to bring in these tools of self-awareness of of being able to make small changes Mm. that's what you can make really small changes that can have a big impact um and you know being the conscious parenting is it is known as a style but it's also i think can be blended really well with with other styles of yoga i mean did I just say yoga? Other styles, Other of, styles parenting. of parenting. Yeah, I get you. <laughs> yeah. Um, whether, you, necessarily... whether you do the Ashtanga style of parenting or Absolutely. the Bikram style yeah. of parenting. Yes, it could be more slow. You could be more authoritative. More yin. <laughs> more permissive. Yeah, actually, there's actually a really good parallel. Here. I feel like there could be a book in this for you to write, you know, down the track when the kids are older. But anyway, we digress. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's never too late to bring mm-hmm. in the self-reflection and awareness and and to bring in these really quick but simple tools, you know, of the breath, of counting to 10, um, maybe that humming bee, you know, using that visual and imagination, whether it's with yourself or with your child. Um, and that so concept of repair, it's never too late to explain and apologize. That's really powerful. Yeah. And connection, I think, is a, is such a big thing for any relationship. It's like if well, if the relationship isn't going well, how can you spend some time in connecting? You know, whether that's again to your partner or even getting on the same page as a coworker, or um, definitely with children, just bringing in some of that childlike play or joy to feel to feel that connection and and notice notice how it affects and impacts that's and also we haven't really talked about that too much but that um yoga teaches us that too is just to actually notice like pause and and spend some time without you know expecting that instant gratification or that instant reward is is um have some time to kind of linger and 
in the in the process. Mm. I love that. You've mentioned a couple of books that we will list in the resources for people who want to dive in deeper. Are there any other resources that you want to mention? Yeah, the the one I big one at the moment, actually two. One is um, the Good Inside podcast, and also uh, the Instagram. It's by Dr. Becky Kennedy, and her Instagram is awesome. She also has a membership as well. If you want to dive deeper, but the Instagram is so great for really bite-sized, actionable strategies. Mm -hmm. And I've learned a lot from her around connection and languaging and, you know, different kinds of words to use, um, especially as the children are getting older now. Mm -hmm. And then there's another book that I really love called Mothering Our Boys. And it's it's specific to boys. And that one's by Maggie Dent, who is an Australian author. Awesome. And for people who have been intrigued by our conversation and they want to learn more about you, where would you send them to? Uh, probably my Instagram, if they want to connect there, um, is Donna D Yoga. Um, they can email me uh, as well if they have any questions. Um, and then my studio website or Instagram as well, Lennox Yoga, where I'm, I'm more active on there. Well, we'll link to all of those. We'll also link to your monthly dose on yoga medicine online. And of course, you teach on yoga medicine online too. So uh, a whole range of classes, pre and postnatal, as well as, you know, regular practices of all levels of energy. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing your thoughtful exploration of relationships with us. Thank you so much for having me, Rachel. It was a pleasure. Always nice to chat you as well. Thanks for listening to Yoga Medicine. If you liked the show, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you got something out of this episode, please spread the word and share it with a friend. You can find more information, articles, trainings, and classes at yogamedicine.com. Check us out on social media as Yoga Medicine, or you can email us at info at yogamedicine.com. Thank you for being part of our Yoga Medicine community. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs.